I've been thinking about sticking some pins in your head. You ready? Let's make a movie, brother. What's up, YouTube? This is your boy John from Project Ellsworth, and I am back with you today to give you my review of the 1988 film Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. If I had that much energy all the time, we'd be going places. So Hellbound begins with Captain Elliot Spencer monkeying around with one of these puzzle boxes. That's who Pinhead used to be. So he manages to get this box to open, and all of a sudden you start seeing hooks grabbing into his skin, pulling on his flesh, very similar to what happened to Frank in Hellraiser. Uh, all the, then you see chains coming in with scalpels on them, cutting lines across his head like a, like a pattern, and then you see chains coming in and start jamming nails into his head, and then a hammer comes in and starts hammering the nails in even further. It looks kind of agonizing. To put it short and sweet, you see Elliot Spencer get transformed into Pinhead. It was a lot easier to just say it that way. Then we jump over to a psychiatric hospital where we see Kirsty. She's a girl who survived the events that took place in the first movie, Hellraiser. What was her name? Ashley Lawrence? And while this cop is interviewing Christy, another cop is at the house where the events from Hellraiser took place in the first movie. He called Cop A at the house, calls Cop B, who was interviewing Christy, and says that the only movable or transportable evidence in this house is a mattress that's covered in blood and chains. Oh, and that he keeps finding other dead bodies hidden in closets and in trunks and normal stuff like that. Now we jump to a doctor named Dr. Genard, who is currently, at this moment, digging into the back of the head of one of his patients with some sort of little drill, and he now wants to go talk to Christy about what took place previously in Hellraiser. I know I keep just saying previously in Hellraiser, but that is so much simpler than trying to explain all this again. Christy all the while is telling the cops, you gotta destroy that mattress, because Julia died on that mattress, and therefore she can come back just like Frank did. These cops have no idea who the hell Frank is. And then she focuses that plea directly on Genard and tells him, Genard, and tells him, you have got to destroy that mattress. Things nasty and covered in blood and chains. Yeah, that's normal. You can almost immediately see it in Chenard's eyes that his wheels are turning. He then tells the cops, I can definitely help Kirsty, but I'm going to need your assistance in order to do so. Now we see Kirsty wandering around inside of this mental facility, and she comes across a girl named Tiffany, who apparently is really good at solving puzzles. So they just let you wander around in there? I know you know. That's why I asked you. Goofball. So then Kirsty goes back to her room, where she starts dreaming about this little girl, Tiffany, solving puzzles and about her bloody skinless father sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall, writing, I'm in hell, please help me, on the wall, in blood. It's probably pretty more common than we know. Happens all the time. Now we jump to Chenard, who apparently keeps patients in padded rooms in like the basement boiler room. I, do rooms like this even exist? Sounds like Silent Hill in there. It kind of looks like Freddy Krueger's house. We get a few shots of either three or four different patients down here, but there's one patient in particular who's in this padded room, sitting on the ground in a straight jacket, crying and pleading to get them off of me. Next, we see Dr. Chenard on the phone with the cops saying that he needs that mattress. He needs the bloody chained up mattress, but he doesn't need it at the hospital. He needs that at his house. <laughs> what? There's gotta be like more questioning or, or something. Dudes, he must have serious pull. I don't even know. Then we see Dr. Shinar basically interviewing Kirsty about Frank and Julia and the puzzle box and Larry and the Cenobites and everything that took place in Hellraiser, up to and including that blood, that Frank died in the attic, and human blood brought him back a little bit at a time, 
and, and, and what Julia did in order to bring Bre bring Frank, can't talk, bring Frank back. I don't know why she knows all that. She definitely knows some of that, but I don't understand how she knows all of the details. She also made the mistake of making sure to tell Gennard that Julia died on that bloody mattress. Next, we jump to Gennard's house. We see that bloody mat, bloody chain mattress laying on the floor in his office because that's normal. We see three of the Cenobite puzzle boxes under glass like appetizers. We see that there is a scrapbook in there documenting the puzzle boxes and Pinhead and or per, Elliot Spencer and all things that he can get his hands on. Clearly, this doctor is a little bit obsessed what's going on here with what's going on here. Leaving out words. Remember that guy that was in the basement padded room with the straight jacket on? Well, now the doctor has him here too. He brings him into the office, takes off his straight jacket, sits him down on that bloody ass bed and hands him a straight razor. Yeah, it'll be fine. Hellbound was directed by Tony Randall. It wasn't directed by Clive Barker this time around. And I could almost immediately tell uh, the opening scene with Pinhead, maybe not so much, but as soon as we got past that, it just, it felt a little bit different to me, maybe a little bit more polished. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but I can definitely say that it is, it feels different. It's a different thing. What was the same was the cast. You basically had the, uh, the same group of players here. You had Claire Higgins was Julia, Ashley Lawrence was Kirsty, Sean Chapman was Frank, Doug Bradley was Pinhead. I don't remember the names of the other three Cenobites, but they were the same actors. And then there's the new guy, Kenneth Cranham. I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. He portrayed uh, Dr. Gennard. The cast in this movie was just fantastic, as it was in the original film. This one was just as solid. The practical effects in this movie are crazy outstanding. I was immediately sold right off the bat when you saw the transformation of Pinhead. Just the way that that was filmed with like grainy trailing chains and and so forth coming in and cutting his skin and you could see the the skin separating and the blood in his mouth and the spikes or, or pins if if you will being hammered into his head it was just it just it looked pretty damn incredible and that's just the beginning of it then you got the crazy guy from the padded room who was begging for you to get them off of me that guy took that straight razor well firstly his torso, the makeup work that they did on his torso was pretty impressive. His torso looked like irritated skin, like he had something on him and he was picking away at his skin until he was scarred and scabbed up. And then when Dr. Chanel, or Chanel, Gennard, what, what the, whatever the hell his name is, when the doctor gave him that straight razor and he started cutting away at his torso, spoiler alert, it just, it looked absolutely amazing. And there's a whole lot of other blood and gut stuff strewn throughout this movie here and there. But the star of this movie was Julia. There's a spoiler for you too. Julia's back. But I think you probably figured that out on your own. I can't imagine that there are very many people out there that saw Hellbound prior to seeing Hellraiser. In Hellraiser, you see the transformation of Frank. You see him slowly gaining muscle and tissue back to become a human again. He doesn't ever quite make it all the way, but you get what I'm saying. You see the muscle and you see the blood and like the sinewy texture of his skin and his face. That's pretty awesome. In this movie, Julia looks incredible. You see, she literally looks wet and slimy for the longest period of time in this movie. Like for maybe half of it, I mean, I didn't time it out, but I'd say half of the time that you see Julia, she's kind of, she's gnarly looking. You can see her, like her spine and her ribs and her back, the bones in her face, like the muscle structure in her. But like I said, she's like drippy and wet and slimy the whole time. The special effects makeup that they put on this woman, or the practical effects makeup, I should say, it's absolutely amazing. And I don't know how many things I've ever seen that looked cooler than Julia did in Hellbound. And they did a few really neat things with her. They like mummy, mummify her at one point. 
where all you can see is like her eyes and her mouth and they're like blood red. They even have gloves on her and you can see her bleeding through some of the bandages. There's other scenes where she's like head to toe, blood and muscle and teeth and eyes, but she's standing in like an all white room. They have another part where just for a couple seconds, she's in like an all white suit, well, suit jacket and white pants. It's just, the contrast that they put her in, the different settings they put her in was actually pretty cool. It was pretty smart. And there was what I guess would be just a little bit of CGI, if you could even call it that, in this movie that looks pretty god awful, but you have to understand that this was this was 1988. CGI was not what it is today, not even in the same galaxy of it. I don't what if this ain't even good enough that I would call it CGI. It's like little blue sparkles like the CGI looks like those LED lights up there. There's a couple things like that, but there's one scene in particular that looks laughable. It's towards the end of the movie when they're in this great big world. It looks like a maze. It looks like they're running around on the top of a maze like the movie uh, Time Bandits. It's an overhead shot of that, if you have any idea what I'm talking about. It's an overhead shot of that, and off in the distance, you see like little sparkles or little flashes of light. It literally... Looks like one of those little sparklers that you hold out in the yard on like Memorial Day and 4th of July. It's pretty ridiculous. And then the very, very, like, basically after the movie's over, the very last scene of the movie, you see a couple of movers go into a house. And at, uh, ironically, it's one of, the, not ironically, but it's one of the movers that was in the original Hell Re whatever. It's an, the mover, the mover from the first movie. They go into this house and for whatever reason, they're there to move furniture and move boxes and move stuff and that bloody mattress with chains on it is still sitting in the middle of the floor. The guy who was in the original Hellraiser, the first mover, goes up to this mattress, sticks his finger in it and looks at it and something grabs him. That part's not so bad, ridiculous, but uh, the part that's really, really bad is like a pillar of souls comes up out of the bed and it looks so bad that it, it really almost surprises me that they even included it in this movie. It looks ridiculous. You can literally see the pillar turning, but you can see like the cutout of the bottom where they, where they like green screened or photoshopped something out. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. I got, I got a little too hung up on that. Hellbound's just a cool movie. I mean, it's, it, you have the, the interested doctor who's he's more than interested, like the obsessed doctor who has all of this knowledge of the, the, the puzzle box and the backstory. He's got access to this kid who's great at solving puzzles. He now has access to Christy. He now knows the story of what happened in Hellraiser or with Christy's family and the Cenobites and all that kind of stuff. Now he even has access to the mattress that Julia died on, which comes in handy for him. Then you have like a little bit of backstory of who Pinhead was and who the Cenobites were. It, it doesn't really get into much detail, but at least you get an idea of who they were. And sprinkle a little bit of betrayal on there with Julia and Frank, and you got a pretty awesome movie. I have not watched Hellbound in a long time. Literally years. And there were little bits and pieces about that movie that I didn't really remember. I remembered a lot of it. I remembered the, the basic gist of it, but there, there were a few details that I didn't quite remember, but it's a great movie. I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's as good as the original one. I do prefer the original film. And the only other movie that I've seen is the third one. I saw that in the movie theater, but I never saw anything after that. And if I did, it was only little bits and pieces here and there. I really don't remember them, uh, but I am getting ready to start reviewing the rest of the franchise so i look forward to doing that and i look forward to sharing all that stuff with you guys leave me some comments down below and let me know how you think hellbound stacks up against hellraiser i'm very curious to see what your thoughts are every once in a while i come across somebody who likes this one more than the first one and i'm just curious to see how you guys feel about it overall all right i'm gonna get out of here if you guys like this video please give me a thumbs up if you really like this video and you've been enjoying my content up to this point, please do me a huge personal favor. Click that subscribe button and ring that bell. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Have a kick-ass day. And thank you for watching.
See you next time, brother.